What is microdosing a GLP-1 like Munjaro or Wegovi? Why is it controversial? Why are so many doctors against it? Let's break it down and talk about what you need to know. The first thing that's really important is that we don't actually have a definition of what microdosing a GLP-1 is. To some people, it is taking less than the minimum therapeutic dose. So let's take Munjaro for today's examples. The minimum dose recommended by the manufacturer is 2.5 milligrams for the treatment of obesity. So anything less than 2.5 milligrams may be deemed a microdose. But there are some doctors out there who say, oh, 2.5 milligrams is still a very low dose for treating obesity. So it's 2.5 milligrams and below. I've then spoken to other doctors who say, actually, in trials, we've really been looking at patients who take 10 to 15 milligrams. So anything below 10 milligrams is a microdose. OK. And then I've also spoken to people who are taking pens and say they have a Munjaro pen for 10 milligram doses and they're using it in a slightly different way. They're counting clicks. They're not taking a full dose from the pen. So because they're only taking five milligrams every week from their 10 milligram pen, they're not taking the full dose. They deem it that they're microdosing. So everyone has a different definition. There is no strictly speaking correct definition because it hasn't been defined. But for the purpose of today's video, I'm going to use taking a smaller than 2.5 milligram dose as a microdose. It doesn't really matter, but just so we're clear. Before we get into the detail, one of the overarching principles of today's video is that if you wouldn't do something with your medicines for other health conditions, do not do it with a GLP-1. We are quite lackadaisical with GLP-1s. We don't necessarily give them the reverence that medicines deserve. And one of the big reasons for that is so many people are obtaining these medicines without ever sitting down with a healthcare worker and having that medical oversight. That medical oversight is so useful in so many ways, in particular that as healthcare workers, we have seen the complications. I've seen patients on GLP-1s who have developed complications. I know the reality of that. I know what that looks like. I know how bad that can be. And so bringing that reality to our decision making and our discussions is very important. And when that's removed, that is a little bit of a concern. And I think that's why we are seeing people being so free and easy with these drugs that are drugs. Also, in this situation where patients are not necessarily sitting down with a healthcare worker, sometimes they're taking on too much of the management themselves because they don't have the adequate support there. And so in the absence of being given lots of good information to make decisions with, they are instead looking for support and guidance to the internet. And the internet is full of misinformation and it's not always easy to detect. I'm a big believer that we should empower patients to be able to take control of their healthcare, but that involves giving them the adequate information and support that they need in order to do that. And that is not where we're currently at with GLP-1s. And I do think the whole system that we've got needs revising. Why do people microdose? There are four main reasons. The first one being that the smallest dose is too strong for them. For one reason or another, they don't feel they can manage that dose. They may have agreed with their provider that continuing and seeing if that side effect or problem will peter out is not the right option for them. And so instead they decide to move to a lower dose. The second reason that people may microdose is that they're using these medications not for their intended purpose, but for other things like inflammation, mental health, addiction, etc. Again, this is all off license, all needs to be discussed directly with your clinician, but some people are using them for other reasons where they may find a different dose works. Another reason that people may microdose is to try and save money. So if they get a 2.5 milligram pen, but don't take the full dose every week, they only take half, they might try and make their pen last longer. I'm going to talk about why I don't recommend this as we go through the video. And the final and fourth reason, again, that I don't recommend for people to microdose is because they only have a small amount of weight to lose. And again, I want to break this down and explain why it doesn't entirely make sense. But first, why do some doctors not like microdosing? The big reason is that it doesn't have any evidence. We don't have any evidence to back it up at all. And so as science-backed professionals, we like evidence and to say to patients, if you take this, this is likely to happen. Here are all our studies that back that up. Whereas if we're doing microdosing, this doesn't have an evidence basis. And so we're experimenting. So we don't like that. Now, to say something doesn't have an evidence base is not the same as saying that it doesn't work. It's just that we don't know. We don't know the benefit. We don't know the risk. There may be things that we don't know we don't know. And so if a patient wants to take a dose other than the recommended doses, we have to have that discussion. It is possible to prescribe those doses though. It's something called off-license or off-label prescribing. This is where a medication is used not in the way that it's intended or not for its intended purpose, but through agreement between the patient and the doctor. And it does accrue additional risk 
beyond typical prescribing. But that's why that doctor needs to sit down and have a chat with the patient and say, look, we can give you this dose. It may work. It might be great, but we don't know. It may have additional side effects. We don't know. It's up to you. Is this something that you want to do? Now, I'm sure there's some of you watching this thinking, well, how hard is this really? If you titrate up the dose of a drug, the effect of that drug will increase, the likelihood of risks will increase, and if you bring it down, surely all those things come down as well. But that's not always how our bodies work. For example, we have antidepressant medications where at lower doses, they have different side effects to higher doses. And we utilize this when we use them because if you have a patient, for example, who can't sleep, at a low dose, some of these antidepressant medications can be very sedating, but if you increase the dose, you lose that effect. So we keep a patient on a lower dose to keep the sedating effects. They'll lose it if we increase it. So medications don't always have that linear basis in how they play out. For risks, we don't know if giving a certain dose may have a risk that we haven't anticipated. You would be taking advice from your clinician. I know there's lots of people on social media giving advice right now, and it's a really difficult time when it comes to this sort of topic. So GLP ones of themselves are already quite controversial. There will always be those people who think that obesity is a lack of motivation disorder. And so they're already a controversial drug. And then factor that into a healthcare system in the UK right now where it's completely stretched to broken and you have patients who are going to doctors and feeling like they're not getting the support they need, they're not being listened to, a lot of doctors in the UK haven't been prescribing these things up until very recently and so maybe they haven't been able to get the advice that they need so patients feel they're being failed and then you have doctors on the other side of it who are stretched to breaking doing far beyond what they should ever be expected to do working to seconds and minutes per patient it's hideous nobody's happy so it's unsurprising that patients are then going, where can I get advice from? Where can I speak to people who are like-minded, who understand me, who might come across as a little less judgmental sometimes? Oh, I'm going to go to social media. Completely understand why people do that. As a clinician who watches a lot of social media, some of the advice is hideous. And sometimes the hideous advice is not always the most obvious. I see people recommending things that are frankly dangerous. Some doctors will tell you that microdosing is truly individualized healthcare. It's trying to modify the medication to fit with the patient. Other doctors will say it's quackery and that it is basically making stuff up on the spot and that is not how medicine works. The reality is many people will sit somewhere between that, but ultimately if you as a patient are looking to change your dose, I would be sitting down with a clinician to have a discussion around what should you do, what's appropriate for you. It is important to bear in mind that when we're talking about Munjaro, particularly here in the UK, all of our doses come in something called the Quick Pen. That's the medical device that delivers the Munjaro. This is designed to be as foolproof as possible. That is a requirement of medical devices to be as safe as possible, to try and have the fewest things that can possibly go wrong. And when we start using medical devices in ways that they're not designed to be used, we are circumventing some of those safeguards. And so for certain vulnerable patients who may be vulnerable because of their comprehension or mobility, trying to tweak and use the pen, a whole host of different reasons that somebody could be vulnerable, but actually trying to get them to microdose and use a device in a way that is not intended is grossly irresponsible. And some doctors would say it's grossly irresponsible for anyone to be trying to use medicines in this way. Let's talk about finance now, because there are people who get pens of their medication, so they'll get a 10 milligram pen of Munjaro, even though their weekly dose is five milligrams, because then they can stretch out their 10 milligram pen over eight weeks instead of four. If you get a pen of Mujaro, it will last unopened if you keep it in the fridge up until the expiry date. If you open that pen, you then have 30 days until it needs to be disposed of. This is for two reasons. One of the big ones being that once you've put a needle through that bung, you will introduce some bacteria into the chamber with the medication. And so there is a limit to how long you can leave that for before you need to throw it away. And the second reason is the medication itself may start to degrade. And so again, you need to dispose of it at 30 days so you can open another uh, pen and get maximum effect from the medication. I have seen social media posts where people have said, oh, isn't it suspect that they've made the date that it needs to be thrown out, the date of how long it lasts. And I think, no, that's product design. It's not some big conspiracy. It's designed to last the length of time that it's needed for. But if you use it beyond that date, then you are potentially risking introducing infection and bacteria from the pen 
in the injection. Now, some people will say, do you know what? It's so expensive. I don't care. I'm still going to take it. It's going to last. I've done it a few times. I've been fine. But it's also a matter of luck and that should be said because when it comes to anything bacteria wise, even if you wipe the bung of the pen with an alcohol wipe, that does not make it sterile. It will still have bacteria on it. Bacteria will still be introduced into the pen. And as with so many things in life, it's look as to which bacteria are introduced and look as to how when you inject into your skin, what happens. You may not get an infection every month, but you are putting yourself at that risk every month. And so I would never advise anyone to take the pen beyond its expiry date. And if you still think that's okay, I would also ask if you like eating expired food because you may be able to see the mold on food. You might not be able to see the bacteria in the pen, but it is essentially the same thing. And for those people who maybe only have five or 10 pounds to lose, who decide they're going to microdose because they don't want a ton of weight loss, this kind of falls down a little bit because the dose doesn't necessarily correspond to the amount of weight you want to lose. I lost five stone on 2.5 milligrams. There are people who are on 10, 15 milligrams who've lost considerably less than that. So your dose doesn't always work out for how much you're, you're trying to lose. When it comes to should people who are five or 10 pounds overweight take these medications, the bigger discussion is around risk versus benefit. So as we've discussed in previous videos, we don't know the long-term risks for things like thyroid cancer. There is a potential risk of NAION that increases with these medications. And is that a justifiable risk to somebody who only has an extra five to 10 pounds to lose and doesn't necessarily have all the additional risks of being obese? The thing is around this discussion, I find it very heartless a lot of the time with many people saying, oh, it's five to 10 pounds to lose. You should just be able to lose that through diet and exercise. But on the way up to gaining a lot of weight, there's a lot of obese people who will have been at this point and said, well, why couldn't I nip it in the bud there? So I don't think the whole, you've probably got a completely different underlying cause of obesity necessarily rings true because people may be on their journey up that way and some people will be managing it differently and on spectrums of why they are overweight and ultimately this is about trying to help people of every size have the best possible life. There are lots of people who have reached out to me personally who are struggling in the menopause who have gained five to ten pounds. It's massively impacting how they feel about themselves. No it's not the same battle as somebody with obesity but it's a quality of life issue for some people and therefore it's worthy of compassion and support but is it the right thing to treat those people with GLP-1? The discussion in this group isn't the dose. It's not about reducing the dose and therefore reducing the risks because we don't know if that's the case. We don't have evidence for microdosing. We don't know if you're at lower risk of the potential long-term side effects if you're on a lower dose. We don't know if you're at higher risk. <laughs> we don't have that information. The discussion around people with a lower BMI but still overweight or people wanting to lose a bit of weight is not about what dose they should take. And so trying to say that this makes it more acceptable I don't think we've got the evidence there to make that argument. The, the issue for this group is, is the risk versus benefit profile there. And at the moment, we don't have the information to say that. So it's not about the dose. It's about whether you should take it at all in the first place. So that is it for today's video. I made this video because so many of you are asking me about microdosing. I have got a Q&A coming up later this week. So if you've got any more questions, let me know in the comments down below. I'm going to do kind of half a Q&A on uh, different topics and another half on my own personal weight loss journey because I do get so many questions on that. So if you've got any questions, let me know and I'll see you guys very soon. Bye.